Okay, well, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, thank you very much to Don Sari and uh, Mike McBride, who were very generous uh, to invite me to speak today. So what I'm going to talk uh, today about is something that... Uh, <laughs> in a moment, well, what I'll, what I'll speak about is uh, something that I, I usually uh, speak in a much, specific way, uh, much more specific way about a single paper, but today I'm going to speak more broadly about my view of why uh, ancient religions survive and sometimes thrive in the modern world. So this will require me, here see, you see a quote, uh, a, some kind of uh, anxiety expressed about uh, how development will affect uh, religion. So the, uh, the, I the idea was uh, up until the 1960s that a secularization uh, theory prevailed, that uh, the coming of the modern world, that is to say uh, the scientific revolution, the enlightenment, the industrial revolution would wipe out religion as we knew it, wipe out what Bronze Age myths and medieval institutions as they were thought. But uh, this didn't happen and we've had to revise our way of thinking about things. And so, the, but, the, but the puzzle I think to some degree remains. How can, if we look at the evolution of GDP per capita over the last uh, few centuries, how can religions uh, adapted to a world like this survive in a world like this. This is a massive transformation in, in society. Well, I'm going to put forward three propositions quite boldly. I'm going to indulge in some speculative excess, of course, and I beg your indulgence for that. But I, I, want, to st I want to put forward to three propositions. One is that there are cases in which development can increase the demand for religion. Even when it does not increase the demand for religious group membership, it can produce more extreme forms of religion, stricter forms of religion. And the third thing is that once formed, these extreme forms of religion survive and spread via various forms of niche construction. So this is based on some work of mine on the Islamic revival, uh, two papers there, and three other papers with a co-author, an excellent young economic historian called Mark Kayama, who were graduate students together at Oxford, on Jewish emancipation in 19th century Europe. So um, the paper on veiling is forthcoming in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, but the rest is unpublished. And in fact, the last two papers are in preparation. So I'm going to give you a sketch of the ideas in this. I want to focus on the broader picture. And so I'm not going to speak in very gr great detail or with any great precision. But this, this work builds upon existing work in the economics of religion, on uh, cultural transmission, the transmission of traits between agents, either intergenerationally from parents to children or for, uh, from peer to peer, and on ideas uh, of education in which education doesn't just increase human capital but it transmits values. And Bowles and Gintis have uh, very, some very early work on that. And as you can see, uh, there are some people mentioned on that list that are not here today. Uh, the, uh, board, if, when I started this work, I went to my advisor, Peyton Young, as Simon Levin mentioned, and I said, I'm interested in culture. And he said, Boyd and Richardson. <laughs> that's all he said. <laughs> and so I had to get those two books. <laughs> and that's how I got started. OK. So here we are. Develop <coughs> well, that's OK. OK, <laughs> uh, development can increase the demand for religion. So this is Tahrir Square, almost uh, a year to the day. And you can see the, uh, the prayer that This is prayer time. You can see the officers getting out of their tanks to pray as well. And was Egypt always like this, perhaps? I don't think so. Uh, the, so by the Islamic revival, what we mean is the, the rise in religious participation amongst Muslims since the 1970s and 1980s. It's Peter Berger describes it as a phenomenon vast in geographical scope, affecting every single Muslim country from North Africa to Southeast Asia. And what it involves is participation in religious organizations, an increase in participation, social welfare organizations, educational organizations, religious proselytizing organizations, political organizations. And in general, 
these, the, the, there's, one, there's many things in common, but they have uh, one thing that they have in common is they share a strict moral code and sometimes a, a will to impose this moral code upon others through the political process. And uh, now to explain this phenomenon, well, let's take a look at uh, some typical uh, a demographic profile of a typical member of an Islamic organization. Well, there are, lots of, there are studies on this. Uh, a lot of these on actual um, ec uh, sort of militant groups because uh, based on arrests, they're easy to track. But this extends right through to very benign social, social service providers and so forth. People who are members of these groups are generally young in the early 20s, middle to lower middle class. So their, fa their fathers may be sort of sh shop sales salesmen and so forth. Uh, they're university educated, often in the elite faculties, which are difficult to get into. So engineering, science, medicine. They are urban based, for example, in the peripheral suburbs of Cairo, and they're recent migrants from small areas or small towns. Okay, and there's plenty of work that looks at this. And what's the macroeconomic background to this phenomenon? Well, this is, this is GDP per capita in these countries. And what you see in a lot of these places is a growth reversal. Okay? And what I'm going to talk about is not the decline in growth per se. I'm not saying that uh, a lack of development increases uh, the demand for religion. I'm going to say that this whole development process sets in train fluctuations in social mobility and different forms of inequality that can increase the demand for religion. That's what I'm going to say. So let's take Egypt. Egypt in 1961, uh, implemented a policy where if you graduated from university, you, well, first of all, university education was free, and if you graduated from university, you were guaranteed a job in the public sector. That drove a, a, a whole lot of social mobility. People moved to Cairo from, uh, from uh, neighboring villages and towns, and they took up higher education, often working hard and getting into the elite faculties, and then they got a job in the civil service and they made their way up. And there was a very rapid period of social mobility. If you look at father's occupations relative to uh, their, their son's progression through the civil service, it was quite rapid. Of course, that had to end at some point. And that ended somewhere in the mid-1980s after inequality had already begun to rise. And at that point, you had a whole generation of people who had uh, elite, uh, degrees from elite faculties who were unable to uh, progress, who actually remained unemployed. The, from the government guaranteed an uh, employed scheme uh, from getting uh, employed straight after graduation, the period uh, b b uh, between graduation and employment gradually increased to 10 years. Nominal wages were held fixed, so real wages fell by about three times, uh, b uh, by about to about a third of its level, sorry. And uh, you had this, this whole generation of uh, young middle class people like this. And so, how, and so how, do, how does this uh, relate to the Islamic revival? Let's look at religious sacrifice, a very simplified model. So you have, let's say you have lambda goods, and these goods are symmetric in some sense with prices and so forth, so that you just take your uh, income Y and you average it across, uh, across goods. So you spend the unequal amount of income on each good. Well, so now, let's look at religious, uh, religious strictness. Let's, let's say you join a religious group that imposes some level of strictness tau. And that means, in this context, that w uh, you cannot consume one minus tau worth of, uh, uh, you can only pr consume one minus tau of the goods on offer in the economy. So these goods are like taboo goods over here, okay? And so you, you spread your income differently and the key thing is that you're going to spread your income inefficiently relative to the case in which uh, you could consume all those goods. Why would you want to do that? That's the question. So this is another way to do it with a particular utility function. And your utility, the indirect utility, comes out to, uh, it's a function of your income and a decreasing function of the religious strictness. So religious strictness actually reduces your welfare. Why would you want to do this? Why would one want to join a strict religious group? Well, the Larry Unicone has a very famous model, a seminal model on this, and it has to do with efficient provision of club goods. I'm going to suggest something that's related, uh, a different explanation. It's a possible explanation that's related to the Islamic revival, and it has to do with the development process in these countries. Okay. 
what happens if people have reference dependent preferences? So they just don't, ca they don't care about their own consumption. They compare their consumption to some expectation of their consumption that was formed before they realized what income they had. So you're taking up education, you're going to university, you have some expectations, some aspirations, and you compare how you, how, how, how you ended up to, the, to those expectations. Well, the way I've stated it, religious strictness affects this comparison. So here, we're compar comparing what we got, or we ended up with, to what we expected, but evaluating it at the level of as if we would have always been in the religious group that we're in, at the religious strictness town. So we're evaluating our expected consumption using our current religious strictness. How do we think about that? Well, let's say you're in a religious group that, that bans certain forms of consumption. Well, you may think that these, these, uh, these types of consumption are illegitimate. And you don't compare your, you don't compare your welfare uh, using those forms of consumption in the calculation. Or you may just be reflecting upon how you did relative to your expectation and you only know what you've consumed and you only appreciate what you've consumed. And so there's two different types, two different ways that religious strictness can affect this comparison through habit formation and through this idea of taboo trade-offs. You don't use those taboo goods in the comparison. Let's assume for simplicity that there's two income classes, that you can either end up with a high income or a low income. You end up with a high income with this probability, uh, theta e. So theta you can think of as a measure of social mobility Sorry, and E is education. E should be education. So the more educated you are, the more likely you are to end up with a high income. And the greater the social mobility, the greater the return from that education. Well now, if you end up with a low income, this is your overall utility with this comparison term in there, with your reference point. And you can see that here, this is actually now increasing in strictness. There's some loss here, some unfulfilled aspirations. And the stricter you are, the, the stricter the religious group you belong to, the lower that loss. The reason is that when you, when you join a stricter religious group, that lowers your reference point. That depreciates the value of having a high income because you can't spread it over all these other goods. And so even though that reduces your own uh, welfare today, but it also reduces your reference point. It reduces your reference point by more. And so religious strictness here acts as a form of ex post psychological insurance, you can think of. We've talk, we looked at how re religious groups, uh, well, a lot of people have looked at how religious groups uh, provide social insurance, but perhaps they also provide psychological insurance against unfulfilled aspirations, which are increasing in education here. So this explains the, the phenomena of educated uh, membership of these groups. So increasing in social mobility, product variety, so explain the antipathy of the introduction of this kind of Western luxury goods and so forth in these countries, and income inequality. So what I'm arguing here is that this kind of Islamic revival, I don't think, would have been possible without this initial burst of, so, of, of social mobility that raised aspirations and that made this particularly, uh, this, I this income inequality here acu uh, particularly acutely uh, felt acutely. So if you think about feudal times, you imagine the serf, he never expects to be the kind of lord of the manor. Though there's massive inequality, that inequality is not very acutely felt. The aspirations are not there. But the development process can generate these aspirations in which inequality can be acutely felt, and religion is one way of managing that inequality. Okay. Here's a, another phenomenon of the Islamic revival. Here's the Cairo University, 1978. Here's Cairo University in 2004. So this is a, a new veiling movement, a rise in veiling. In Cairo, we, uh, veiling actually disappeared from public spaces in 1923 with the public deveiling movement. In 1969, it was unheard of. You didn't see middle class and upper class women veiling. Around this time, you have about 80% of women who veil in Cairo. How do, well, how do we think about that? And how does this relate to this uh, surge in Islamic group membership and participation? Well, this is the way I think about it. The, at this time, there was, a, there was a massive urbanization, which I talked about, 
due to the incentives that were provided and through due to development, there was also increasing female labor force and educational participation. So what happened was women who usually interacted, they took up, the, the environment of interaction was the same as their community. And a community, I'm thinking about the opinions that they, the people whose opinions they care about, the parents, relatives, friends, and so forth. Well, these really coincided. But with development, and it, as economic opportunities uh, open up outside your community, gradually a disconnect can appear within these two things. And how, so women face increased economic opportunities, but they may face, by taking those up, they may face a loss of community esteem because they may face negative influences. As they take up education and work outside of their community, it may mean that uh, they, uh, the uh, members of their community believe that they are violating community norms while they are outside the monitoring range of their community. And how do they deal with this tension? Well, one way is identity, okay, by veiling. And the idea is that veiling acts as a commitment mechanism to abiding by religious, religious norms of behavior even when you're outside the monitoring range of your community. And there are many different ways, and I, and I justify them in paper. I'll speak briefly about this. I've presented this, in this to, to the IMBS before, so I'll be brief. Basic structure of the model is there are two types of agents. There are religious and non-religious agents. And let's say a proportion Q of the agents in the community are religious. And women decide whether to integrate, that's take up work or education outside of the home, or segregate. Integration confers an economic benefit, but it also introduces temptation to violate religious norms of behavior. Okay? So veiling, veiling enables them to deal with that. They choose a continuous degree of veiling between 0 and 1, and high degrees of veiling represent higher, greater commitment. So this is what happens as you set the model up and work out the equilibrium. The basic equilibrium structure is like this. As the community becomes more religious, the community you face is, uh, you care about the opinions of your community. Those are commu opinions are based on the, the values of that community. So the more religious people are, there are, the more religious values are going to weigh in so social opinions. And so therefore you want to send a more religious signal. So this is, the, this is the veiling of religious types. You can see it increases with the proportion of religious types in the community Q. The thing is, secular types actually never want to veil in this model for personal reasons, but they may dissimulate for social reasons. And as the proportion of religious types in the community goes above some threshold, even secular types start to veil. And that's a key consideration uh, in the debate over bans on veiling. What happens when we have integration? What happens when women take up work and education outside of the home? Well, their level of veiling increases for both of these types. And that's for the reasons I've spoken about. And so veiling here, this is very different to the interpretation of veiling as a retrogressive move. This is about this new veiling, a large part of it is about integration. Some partial form of integration, but integration at least. And so what I suggest is this rise in veiling since the 1970s is linked to the strengthening of religious values in Muslim societies, this increase in Q, and changes in the environment due to economic and social development. So the, the change, internal migration, <coughs> migration to cities, urban-based environments where this occurs. But also the same processes that I talked about when, um, that, I, that I mentioned with uh, regard to Cairo apply in uh, Europe and the United States. External migration, migration to uh, areas in which li uh, liberal and secular values prevail. And therefore that, in, um, that schooling, for example, in that kind of environment provides a greater threat. Increased female education and labor force participation, exposure to Western cultural products. So this is the development process that's essentially increasing the demand for religious identity. And so we are bridging that kind of transitions that occur and that women must make in the developmental process. Now, understanding the effect of development on, on religious identity is important. Why? Because it's important to understand, for example, where the bans on veiling which have been proposed and implemented in countries like France and Belgium, Turkey, since 1925, for example, uh, will be, can be counterproductive. And can they be? Well, in this model, veiling, as you wouldn't be surprised to know that, if you ban veiling, this inhibits integration. This is about integration in this model. But the more surprising result is that if you embed this model in a model of intergenerational transmission, of values where parents can invest some resources in educating their children and instilling religious values in them. Well, what happens is uh, a ban on veiling 
can actually increase religiosity. There's an open set of parameters under which that occurs. And why is that? It is because parents have greater incentive to invest in religious education when the behavior of religious and secular children is far apart, if it diverges. Now, if, if you ban veiling and secular types, secular children integrate while not veiling, so you ban veiling in public spaces, they integrate while not veiling, but religious types segregate, then that drives a big wedge between the behavior of religious and secular types and provides very sharp incentives for religious education of children. And therefore, religiosity increases in these communities. And you can show that in a very general way, beginning in any state QT with the proportion of religious types Q, and you ban veiling, well, every period after you ban that veiling, the proportion of religious types is larger than if you hadn't banned veiling. Okay. <clears throat> so what happens when development may not increase the overall demand for religion, but it produces more extreme forms of religion? Well, that really comes out of our work on Jewish emancipation in 19th century Europe. And this is, I think, a fascinating uh, episode. What you had across uh, pre-industrial Europe, Jewish communities were more or less homogeneous since the diaspora period because they remained in relative isolation. There were all kinds of restriction on their, on their movement, on their occupational selection, marriage, and so forth. And this is what Vital says. They all displayed substantially similar political, social, and economic features. But that isolation began to break down, and this were deliberate moves by, uh, by, uh, by it, starting in France, well, starting sort of with Joseph II's Edict of Toleration, and then really taking hold during the French Revolution, the National Assembly uh, emancipated French Jews. This was spread through the uh, revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, and uh, gradually by the time of the German unification in 1870, uh, Europe's Jews had generally been emancipated, what we call emancipated. And so these are the early part, these are the early places where they were emancipated. Prussia in 1812, Rhineland during the, uh, during the um, uh, uh, revolution in Napoleonic War, subsequently reversed, but then uh, by 1870, this was all emancipated. What was, the, what was the response to emancipation by Jewish communities? Okay, because this tells us something about how globalization, the increased uh, prospect of out-group contact and development uh, affect the character of religious groups. Well, in Germany, a liberal variant known as reform emerged. This was about cultural integration, taking up the new opportunities. The liturgy was uh, made much more like uh, the, the Protestant liturgy. Choral singing was introduced in, in, uh, in temples and so forth. And, uh, and this was all about cultural integration and, to, and, and accessing these new opportunities. In Eastern Europe, various forms of uh, orthodoxy emerged. So traditional Judaism was worked into reworked into various forms of orthodoxy, <coughs> which emphasized strict adherence to rabbinical law, and including ultra-orthodox Judaism. I'll talk about that more in a moment. In Russia, emancipation was pretty limited, and therefore traditional Judaism remained largely intact. And so how do we explain these drastically different responses. So I'll have two models emphasizing different things and with, with uh, two, different real, two really different approaches to this. So let's consider, to begin with, a game played by N individual agents and a religious authority. So there's one religious group in each area. Agents can have low or high attachment to this community that they're in. The religious authority announces the level of strictness. Okay, it's going to choose that optimally in a way that I'll describe in a moment. Agents decide then whether or not to become members of the group. They can leave the group. And agents who decide to become members of the group make effort and money contributions to the community, which produces a religious club group. So this really builds from Larry and Akona's work. How do effort and money contributions work? Well, you can devote a uh, proportion E of your effort or time to the community and one minus E to income generating activities outside the community. Income generating activities outside the community, of course, earn you some income. And income is this. 
So it depends on the proportion of time or effort you allocate to these activities times lambda, which is a productivity parameter. You can think of that as measuring the level of economic development. It's the payoff of agents who are outside the group, essentially. And tau, which is your level of strictness. Now, as that goes to 1, you don't earn any income. So think about this in the traditional way of uh, stigmatizing behaviors and forms of identity that reduce your income generating, active, uh, your, uh, act, uh, income generating opportunities outside of the community. So agents in divide the income between private consumption and a financial contribution to the community, a donation. So the religious groups face a trade-off now. If they l reduce tau and allow agents to integrate, they lose their time and effort. But their members may make a lot of money and donate money back to the community. And so where do they fall on that? Well, you, one would expect perhaps in areas of low development, low lambda, they would, the increase in donations, because the increase in income is not very large, the increase in donations would not compensate the religious group for the lost time. And therefore, the strictness would remain high. And, and the opposite in areas of high development. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because of exit. And actually, this is what happens as development increases, lambda increases. You get these uh, non-monotonic uh, non behavior. So you could think of this as kind of uh, imperial Russia. The, you have very little, uh, what, essentially what happened was with emancipation, you had these homogeneous communities that existed in relative isolation from their surroundings. Suddenly there was this emancipation and these communities were thrown into different economic worlds. And based on the economic uh, world that they were in, they reacted in different ways. So here's a low level of lambda. It's, go, you, it's going to be, you're going to have a pretty high level of strictness because you value uh, the agent's time uh, more than their financial donations. Now, as, you, as, as development goes up, the problem is as you, uh, you cannot maintain this high level of strictness because low attachment types are going to exit. And so you have to start to liberalize as development goes up. Well, the problem is at some, you have to liberalize so far at some point that it's worth your while to increase strictness, induce high, low attachment types to exit, and just cater to high attachment types at a higher level of strictness. And so here you get a schism occurring. The community splits. Part of the community leaves. And you get a very high level of strictness, a very strict group emerging, a sect, a strict sect. And then you get a liberalization as you get further development. And so this is, this is what happened in Germany. Do we see evidence of this? Yes, exactly. Hungary is, what we, is, uh, is where we see this. Initially, there was a reform movement in Hungary. And then, in 1869, this, this split. They officially split. And they became the most stringent form of ultra-orthodoxy in Europe, actually. And this was an intermediate, uh, intermediate country in terms of development. So, in the paper, we, we then embed this in a, uh, in, in a model of intergenerational transmission of values and we see how, uh, how religious groups can affect the distribution of high and low attachment types and uh, whether that affects things and that does affect things. You, in the intermediate ranges you can get religious cycles occurring, cycles of strictness over time and you can get, and what you do get is that when you have, when agents operate outside of the community, if they lose their attachment, there's some probability that they lose their attachment, well then you get uh, the then you get these highly strict groups occurring under a greater, larger range of parameters because they care, they care about the dynamic effects of this, of this liberalization. Okay. What about Jewish education? There was also m m not just a polarization in the strictness of these groups, but also on the character of their education. So reform uh, groups uh, really had a massive e escalation in secular education. The ultra-Orthodox groups were exactly the opposite. They clamped down on secular education. Secular education was more frowned upon, actually, than under traditional Judaism. Why is that? Well, let's look at, uh, let's take a view of, edu of education as a form of socialization, as a form of value transmission. So it, economists usually think of education as improving wages, improving productivity. But perhaps it also produces positive spillovers, encouraging civic culture, public spiritedness, etc. 
And so there's some work on this. But something that's been overlooked, I think, is that for minority communities, these positive spillovers, that these things that are positive spillovers for majority communities may actually be negative spillovers. So what is pro-social may be anti-communal. So let's say that the educational institution, taking up education, transmits the values of the majority. Well, that's actually a cost for a minority community. Let's say secular education transmits secular values and undermines your attachment to a community, for example, your religious community. Well, that's a cost. So here's Solomon Maimon. I'd received too much education to return to Poland to spend my life in misery with our rational occupational society and to sink back into the darkness of superstition and ignorance from which I had delivered myself with much labor. And you can see the rabbis actually had real concern with this kind of thing going on. That's what I mentioned previously. And so how do we think about this? Well, this is a, let me have a very crude illustration of the model. They just take up education, and based on their education, their level of education, E, e I, they, uh, they, acquire religious, uh, they acquire religious or secular values. The probability that they acquire secular values is increasing in their degree of education. In addition to that, after they acquire values through education in the interim stage, they also, there's also a social transmission, a peer-to-peer -peer transmission of values. Okay? It doesn't occur exactly on a network like that, but it occurs like this. So consider a community composed of a continuum of agents. Each agent is endowed with a type, sigma i. And there are some uh, zero types. And you can actually state it much more generally than this, but let's deal with this for now. So there's a cumulative distribution function f, with support being this interval. Now education yields an economic payoff to a sigma type of lambda to the sigma e. That's their level of education. This is their type sigma, and see, which, is a, which is a real number, and lambda, which we think of as the return to education. So for an increase in lambda, an increase in the return to education, there are going to be different benefits across types depending on sigma. Now, so education shapes values, as I mentioned, with probability EI, agent, which is their education, agent I becomes a carrier of non-religious values. And then they transmit these values via social contact with some assorted of matching, so that religious types in the interim stage are more likely to be matched with religious types in the next stage. What happens? Well, the mean level of education is increasing in the return to education lambda. So far, so good. That's a standard result, right? But that has implications for the distribution of education across types. So let's define, let's say I's equi equilibrium education is decreasing in the return to education lambda. Well, if that occurs, then I resists education. Well, what you see in these models is that there exists an open set of types that either resists education or chooses zero education, which means that as the, the returns to education are increasing, there are always a, a set of types with positive measure that are decreasing education. And why is that? Because as the returns to education increase, remember, average educational attainment increases. But that means there are more carriers of non-religious values in the population. And so there's, there's, a, there's a greater threat to religious types who want to remain religious from social contact, right? And so because of the assorted matching, they want to then start out, uh, they want to then, uh, in the interim stage, be religious because then they're more likely to be matched with a religious type. And that lowers the threat of being, becoming non-religious in the social transmission phase. And therefore, they reduce their education as a way to insulate them against acquiring non-religious values. And so this is, I think, explains the polarization in educational outcomes in uh, Judaism following emancipation. You had some agents that formed these, uh, these uh, very tight-knit, uh, very strict groups, but they had individual incentives to do this in terms of maintaining their values and insulating themselves from this development. And it's development itself that can produce this kind of extreme levels of 
uh, behavior. Okay, so extreme forms of religion survive and spread via niche construction. So I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to say these things in front of such <coughs> illustrious biologists, <laughs> but uh, let me uh, float some ideas. Okay, here's a beaver. This is a form of niche construction. Beaver changes its uh, selection environment through a form of uh, niche construction, this dam building. So how do these, the question is how do these extreme forms of religion survive for so long? Well, here we have diamond traders in uh, Antwerp and New York. And you, these, are, these have been long been dominated by Orthodox Jewish communities. And how, how does this happen? Well, d trading in diamonds is a very high trust business. They're very easily concealed, very high value. And so what you need is very severe punishments for any kind of cheating in this, in this game. And how is that sustained? That can be sustained in, in groups in which you spend almost all your time in the groups, in the group. So that punishment, ostracism, is very costly to you because you lose all kinds of interactions. And that's what happens when you have very strict, these very strict religious groups. And these can be generated by, through development. And they survive by finding, locating these niches in which these, it actually has an economic payoff. <coughs> but that's not the only thing. <coughs> what about, but some groups carve out niches. So what's the, what's the poorest place in the United States, according to earned income? Does Southeast. anyone? Southeast? In terms of just, uh, just anything above the village level. There's, there's a sort of town. <coughs> Pardon? Does anyone know? It's in Orange County, New York. <laughs> <coughs> 50 miles northwest of New York City. Ultra-Orthodox Jews. Uh, Hasidic, ultra-Orthodox Jews, right? So not all diamond, it's not, not all these communities are involved in the diamond trade. Per capita income, less than 5,000. Mean uh, family size, six. Uh, Ar median age 12, <coughs> and how, how, how does a uh, community like that survive 50 miles northwest of New York City, right? Why don't people just get up and move? And as development gets, gets stronger, as wages in the outside economy get higher, surely the selection pressures are going to be quite, quite severe, but maybe not. Think about education occurring over two time periods. There's initial education, you can think of that as chosen by your parents. And then there's another period of education that you can choose, let's say. And let's suppose a job requires a total education of Lambda. So you move to the city, you have to have a total uh, education of Lambda to get the job. Well, for someone, <coughs> if you were going to spread the education out over those two periods, you would if you had this quadratic cost function, for example, you can do this in many different ways, you would, uh, you would incur, you would split it, split this lambda over the two periods, and you would, you would take on lambda, half lambda education in each period for a total cost of half lambda squared, right? <coughs> what happens if you, didn't, you weren't able to get education to begin with? Your parents chose zero education. Okay. <coughs> Let's think about the Amish, for example. They have an institution where when you're 16 years old, you're allowed outside of the community and then you can decide whether you to remain part of the church or not, or to leave. What proportion of children do you think uh, come back? 95%. Yeah, something like that, something, 90, 95, 80, something 85 to 95 percent, yeah. Okay, so if you, want, if you then couldn't take education on there, you'd have to take all, the whole lambda in the second period <coughs> and for a cost of lambda squared if you want the same job. The difference in the cost between people who started out in the religious group and people who are outside of the religious group is half lambda squared, and that's increasing in lambda, increasing in the educational requirement. So as development increases, technology expands, and require more and more education to get these jobs, actually the switching costs outside of, out of these groups can actually increase. You're at a competitive disadvantage. The competitive disadvantage of people who are born into these groups increases. And so they carve out a niche, essentially, even as the, um, the real wages in the economy are increasing. OK, so I'm actually a little bit early. So the idea here is that development can create forms of inequality 
Okay? Different forms of inequality based on fluctuations in social mobility that come with development and threats to existing value systems and forms of organization which increase the demand for religion and or produce more extreme forms of religion, more strict, stricter forms of religion, that's what I'm saying. So once these extreme forms of religion emerge, once they form, they're remarkably stable due to high levels of trust, switching costs, and fertility, which is something I haven't mentioned. These groups have very high levels of fertility as well. Ellie Berman has looked at this for ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel. And uh, others have, uh, uh, and you can, you can look at, as I mentioned, with the community in uh, New York State, there is a very high levels of, uh, and the poorer, the poorer a community gets, often the higher the fertility rate, and therefore, this is also, I think, part of niche construction. OK. I'm going to take questions. Questions, comments? Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I was wondering, you connect a lot of what you speak to with religions. And I was wondering how much of this uh, might be generalizable to the conflict The okay, so I, I think I think it is partly. For example, you can think of the uh, uh, creationist movement, for example, as a, as a, as a kind of a resistance to education, a resisting education, right? You don't you, th you believe that that kind of education will perhaps perhaps let's say you believe that it demystifies things and ruins your experience of uh, of being religious or it may change you from being religious to non-religious. Well, then what you're going to do is you're going to actually reduce your scientific education and increase your religious education. So that's one way you can think about it. And as, as, the, uh, as the education, as uh, the kind of uh, the evidence for evolution mounts, in fact, it becomes more and more dangerous to you. And you may actually reduce your education even further. That's one application of the model that I showed. So I think it is generalizable. And the resisting education paper is actually a general paper about, about identity and about polarization amongst different groups. Why do we see education polarization amongst different ethnic groups and different uh, religious groups? Um, yeah, if you, so if you, if, you, if you look at even today, these, a lot of the different uh, heterogeneity in Judaism was formed during the, uh, uh, in post-emancipation. But you see it even in the data today. Look at American Jews. Look at the education of Reformed Jews. They have the highest levels of education. Then modern Orthodox, then Orthodox, then ultra-Orthodox. And so these, these, this polarization survives. Yes? Um, I'm kind of um, curious and maybe even dubious about the resisting the education. Okay. Uh, in the case of, for example, Turkey and Bailing. Yes. Um, because all the secular institutions, like all the public education, for example, yes. they promote secular <coughs> ideas. And according to this kind of modeling, I guess you would expect religious people to resist education because of the secular yes. of all education. <coughs> yes. But what happens is actually they, like those like strict religious people, nonetheless go to the go through this public education, yes. always maintain their you know, identity, yes. so it's a matter of identity, but that doesn't necessarily stop them from you know, the education, you know, the secular education. And okay. why do you think I, that is? I beg to differ. <laughs> and that is, if, if you look at Turkey's f female to male enrollment rate in tertiary institutions, it's very low. I've seen figures where it's the second lowest in the Middle East. Only Yemen is lower. And why is that? Well, if we look at uh, actually evidence, an excellent evidence by uh, someone in Stockholm called Eric Meyerson, an excellent young economist. And what he shows is that if you look at the, the mayoral elections in 1994, where the Islamic parties won a lot of uh, mayoral elections, you look at uh, elections in which the Islamic parties just won to elections in which they just lost. So you apply a regression con discontinuity approach. And you compare female educational outcomes in these two cases. What you find is that where Islamic parties just won, they, uh, female education went up. And they went up especially amongst poor families and, and pi religiously pious families. And wh why did that happen? Because, as you mentioned, the, the education system is, is run by the Ministry of Education, which is a secular institution, no headscarves in public schools and so forth. But, what, but financing of schools is up for grabs in Turkey. So what you had, these Islamic mayors, 
uh, encouraged the funding of schools by Islamic trusts, and they added all they they introduced all these religious add-ons, dorms in which you could wear the headscarf, Quranic study groups around the schools, and that motivated uh, conservative families to send their daughters to school. And so I think this evidence is there in Turkey even. Yes. So you're. Uh uh, portrayed the uh, <coughs> development is evolving through this lambda through the efficiency of of earning in uh, in in, the, in wage, well, well in modern economy. Right? But uh, you introduced earlier this idea of, of set points that people would have these aspirations, set point aspirations. Yes. Somehow the the uh, the evolution of the set points disappeared from your from the from the talk. I, I wonder if they disappeared from the models as well, or is there? No, they did, they did. So they're different, uh, they're different models, essentially, with different ideas uh, that, are, that are geared to the, to the individual kind of uh, uh, puzzles that come up in these different cases. So, do you, so, your, so they, do, they do disappear. So I, we, I think aspirations are very important in the, in the Egyptian case, especially of the Islamic revival, but I'm not sure how, how important they are in, and they may be important in many, other, in many other cases. Look at the Occupy movement today, for example. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A movement that comes after very high aspirations, but then uh, kind of dawning that these are not going to be fulfilled. So it, it struck me that the difference between uh, some place like Egypt and some place like uh, Britain, uh, which became highly secular, is yes. that uh, for the most part, uh, uh, people's aspirations were met in, in economies that de uh, broadly developed. In countries like Egypt that had the stall developments, then many educated kids' aspirations were, <coughs> were uh, frustrated. So would th th that would seem to make a big difference in the, uh, in the secularization versus uh, uh, increase in religion. That's right. And also the uh, provision of, the, so another thing that I, that I didn't mention, I haven't focused on, is the provision of, uh, of, pub, of, of welfare, for example. Government provided welfare in Britain is much higher than in Egypt. And so you, uh, and something I didn't focus on, but you see, that is in the, in the model, in the paper, which is a more elaborate model, that was a very simplified version, is that your, um, your, your, your income, your current levels of consumption also it's not just the inequality, but also your current income. So income, uh, poverty, and aspirations, are all t uh, and social mobility, these are all connected. And, uh, and if, you have a, if you have a very low level of income, then it's worth it for you to try and cope with these unfulfilled aspirations by joining a strict group. But if you have a high level of income, then it destroys too much of your consumption. And, if you, and, and social welfare systems kind of stay, can can, can raise that level of minimal level of welfare to the extent where you don't get this kind of coping. So stagnant and declining incomes in, you know, amongst the poorer people in the, in the U.S. could be part of the uh, reason for the increase in strictness of, uh, of churches, and that's particularly those that serve the uh, bottom tier of the population. It, it could be. We need to te test that. I don't know. I'm not. So, I hope you don't think so? Well, I mean, the rise of fundamentalism occurred with the increased middle in class e incomes in the U.S. in the 1970s and 80s. An increase in inequality, though, as well. No, a decrease in inequality. Up till 1980, there was a decrease in inequality. And afterward, you know, yeah. it started getting an increase. There is, there is work in sociology that shows that uh, part, a lot of it is about s fertility. In fact, uh, uh, Rob Boyd put me onto that work. And uh, a lot of the event, uh, rise in uh, the increase in at least one paper suggests that th that fertility plays a large role in the evangelical movement. Uh, I'm not sure that American fundamentalism, Christian fundamentalism, was relate closely related to um, uh, denials. You know, tau large tau. Maybe you could say something about that because yeah. you know it was basically faith. But everybody's middle class. They send their kids to school. Yeah. And you know they don't. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah. So I don't argue at all in the paper that it is. Um, but I, I, I believe it is there it has something to do with it in the Egyptian context, and it may have more relevance broadly. But I'm, I, I'm not, I don't want to make that claim that it's broadly applicable. I mean, you could think about uh, the growth reversals in Latin America accompanying the Pentecostal revival there, for example. But one would have to look into that more closely. In, in Israel, the fundamentalism is, is, um, is supported by the welfare state. So if you that's right. <coughs> So, so your, your level of material affluence goes up as you become more strict. That's, well, that's right. 
so there's subsidies for these for, for strict groups, and that's what Ellie Berman has showed very nicely in the paper. But the uh, the key here, uh, for example, in the the community in New York, is that even without those subsidies, you could carve out a niche. These communities can carve out niches in which they can be remarkably stable. And that's the, that's the bigger puzzle, I think. Yes, Larry. Yes. What you're really contrasting it to is not religion and spirituality, but collective activity. It's, it's, it's production or utility that is somehow derived from being a part of a group and devoting your effort there. Yeah. And uh, you're assuming, uh, and uh, how far be it for me to criticize you since I've used a lot of like this myself, <laughs> but the education you're talking about isn't just a, a general productivity parameter, it's, it is a kind of biased productivity that is enhancing your, uh, you could call it secular productivity, but what it really is, your production of, of individual goods uh, relative to what you're producing inside the club. Yes. If, if the productivity parameter affected both simultaneously, uh, you, you get a rather different model. And, and in particular, imagine, take, take uh, literacy, yes. which certainly increase, increases your productivity across the board. In certain types of religions, in particular, for example, uh, Protestantism, uh, literacy is a very important component <coughs> of religious productivity too. And yes. uh, in part, I think because of that, these religious groups that otherwise discourage various forms of education tend not to discourage uh, literacy at all, whereas That's right. Catholics or some other group might. Uh, my point here is simply that the mechanism you're dealing with primarily is group versus individual, uh, at least in some of this discussion. Uh, that and. Uh, and that has to be kept in mind. It also gives it some power to extend to, say, you know, subcultures uh, that aren't particularly religious, uh, uh, you know, poor, uh, underclass that seem to be remarkably resistant to education. But there, too, the trade-off could be between remaining a tight community or part of a tight yeah. community and uh, attaining productivity, more productivity as an individual. That's right. So I think uh, so. I, it is a biased. Uh, form of pro pro productivity enhancement. I think you said it much better than I did. Um, the, and and that, that's right. So this is a, a kind of a simplified exposition of, of what we're talking about there. But uh, so for example, what, one, thing, one thing we're working on is a, uh, in, this, in, this, in the final paper that I showed you, is a uh, history of Jewish education after the, after the Middle Ages. We have something up until the Middle Ages, the Bodicini and Eckstein paper, where we see that um, uh, Jews have very high levels of literacy. This is what you, this relates to what you're saying. Uh, even when they're farmers, and there's no return to literacy, and they 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 trace that back to the destruction of the temple in, in 70 A.D., where the essentially the Sadducees re led the revolt against the, the Romans, and the Sadducees, the priestly caste, were wiped out, which left the rabbinical class, the scholarly class, and that changed the character of the religion. It from from be, uh, to be a Jew, it, it was no longer, you had to believe. Now you had to be able to read the Torah. And so at the Bar Mitzvah, you have to read and so forth. And, uh, and so literacy became tied to religion for non-economic reasons. And so Jews had a, ver a big advantage in education. But what happened was when you had a uh, scientific revolution and as uh, Europe, as, uh, as kind of uh, cr Christian and Catholic Europe started to, uh, started to, uh, started to rise in some sense, uh, the education became tied to, became biased in that sense. It started, it started uh, sort of communicating the values or enhancing the participation, participation in the broader Christian community or the mainstream community outside the Jewish community. This is what, what, what you're saying. Uh, Jewish communities were relatively sheltered from that because they were ghettoized, especially in that, at that time they were heavily ghettoized and isolated from the rest of the community. But emancipation unleashed those forces. And that's why you get this kind of polarization that we think also occurred in emancipation. And it's a complex story. And it has to do with group, group membership, just like you say. Yeah, the one other point I wanted to, to make was the complicity line of your work is that this is just a group activity versus individualistic activity. A lot of what the dynamics of the story are on groups competing uh, for authority, uh, membership for, for power. Uh, that's right. That's right. We, we think that's very important. And, 